I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of them whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Thanks, Lori. At this time, uh, we would uh, welcome any, anyone ages five through nine that would like to go to Children's Chapel. You can be uh, dismissed. You can meet Mr. Childress there at the, the center back door and others who can uh, lead you to your next step. <clears throat> when, um, when our sons were, were in college, they, they went to school out in the, the suburbs of Philadelphia, out on the west side of Philadelphia. And during that season of life, uh, Sandy and I would make the trip up there to visit with them pretty, pretty frequently because um, not only did we miss them, but they, they had some activities that would go on, particularly in different seasons of the year. And so there were, there were certain times of the year where we would make that trip um, once a week, sometimes even twice a week, just depending on what the schedule was. And so, so we, we grew accustomed to, to making this drive, this round trip, and, and it was actually sort of a, I won't call it romantic, but it was, it was sort of a, a sweet time in our life because we would once or twice a week have this somewhere between, you know, three and five hours in the car on any given day uh, that we would make this round trip, and so it was kind of nice to, to do that, that drive. But when we would come home, the first 45 minutes or so of that trip were, were pretty hectic because we would have to come, we would have to navigate down the Blue Route, merge onto I-95 heading south, and we would have to get into this congested area around Newark, and then we'd have to navigate our way over to the east to get over into Delaware more. And, um, and then eventually we would, we would arrive in this little town in Delaware called Middletown. And middle, arriving in Middletown was sort of like the... Ah, part of the trip, because once we got to Middletown, we could get on Route 301, and once we got to 301, all we had to do was follow 301, merge onto Route 50, and come across the Bay Bridge, and that whole part of the trip was actually quite relaxing, because there was very little traffic, very little drama, very few decisions that had to be made, and so it was really quite simple. Well, the reason I share that with you is because 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is sort of like coming to Route 301 on that trip. Um, we have been covering quite a bit of territory as we have been walking through Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. We've had to navigate some pretty challenging topics of discussion. We've, we've been looking at topics like the roles of men and women in the church. We've looked a little bit at the doctrine of predestination. We've most recently been looking at different spiritual gifts, particularly some of the gifts that, that we might refer to as sign gifts, like the gifts of prophecy and the gifts of speaking in tongues and things like this. And the, the complexity of, of those things, I think, has been pretty, pretty obvious. Um, you know, I've been 
speaking about these things, and I've been kind of giving you a sense of kind of how I see these things, and some of you have very politely responded with some emails to me and say, well, I don't know that I agree with you on that. And you know, we've had some, some good interaction and those kinds of things. But, but we're kind of moving from some of those difficult topics into some things for the rest of this book that I think we will find to be more foundational and, and more the kind of things that we all kind of read and look at and say, yes, these are familiar ideas. These are foundational. They're not ideas that we tend to find a lot of disagreement on. But my caution to us is that just because we come into some areas of, of this book that are less controversial or less complex, that we not just take them lightly and that we not relax too much because here's, here's sort of the trade-off. Whereas these other topics have been more difficult and more challenging to wrestle through, the reality is that those topics really don't have to do with our salvation. In other words, it's not what you believe about those things that affects whether or not someone is saved, whether or not someone has eternal life. Because godly men and women can disagree over the gift of tongues. Godly men and women can disagree even over the doctrine of predestination or the roles that, that men and women should or should not play in the life of the church. But as we come into these more, more basic, more foundational ideas that Paul is teaching us, we actually are starting to get into things that have to do with our salvation. That if we don't understand these things and if we don't embrace these things by faith, these, top, these topics really are, we could say, things to die for because they really are foundational to what it means to have a relationship with God through faith in His Son, Jesus. If I had to boil down today's message to one question, the question would be this. What exactly does someone have to believe in order to have eternal life? What do we need to believe in order to have a restored relationship, a reconciled relationship with the God who made us such that we can have eternity with Him as our hope and our future? This question specifically is, is what Paul answers in verses 3 through 6 of our passage today. But I want to I read for you again verses 1 and 2 just to kind of hear how he sets this up, how he sets the stage for what he's about to say in 3 through 6. In 1 and 2, he says, Now I would remind you, brethren, of the gospel. The gospel that I preached to you, the gospel which you received... And the gospel in which you stand and by which you are being saved. In other words, this gospel is foundational for what we believe in order to be saved. If you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, he says. Now, I just want to say something very quickly about that little end phrase there, unless you believed in vain. I don't believe that Paul is, is trying to get us to be anxious about our faith. I don't think he is, he is saying, unless there's something wrong with your faith. Unless, unless there's, there's something wrong with the quantity of your faith. Unless you don't have enough faith. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think what he's saying is, unless what you're believing is actually not true. And we'll get into that more next week, because next week, in the next section of Scripture, Paul actually starts to unpack the question of, is this true or not? Can we believe this with confidence or not? And so, so I, I, I want to encourage you to not be distracted by or not be somehow discouraged by Paul somehow saying, you may not have, have adequate faith. I don't think that's really his point. But he is saying, I need to come back to the foundation. I need to come back to the gospel. In fact, he, this, is, this is how he continues on in verse 3. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance. That's the way he prefaces his reference to 
the gospel that he's explaining in these verses. Meaning that the gospel really is the highest priority in what we believe. These other things that we've talked about, they're not unimportant, but they're not the most important. This is really where Paul gets into this, where he's basically saying, if you want to know what it is to major in the majors, to keep the main thing the main thing, this is what I'm about to say to you. And so I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that He appeared to Cephas, who is, which is Peter's other name, his, you know, his, his, the name that, that he went by before Jesus met him and changed his name to Peter. He also appeared to the twelve apostles, And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. And then jumping down to verse 11, he says, so this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. This is the foundation of the Christian faith. And I think it's very very important here, we'll we'll look at this a little bit more next week as, as Paul gets more deeply into the, the, his teaching about the resurrection of Jesus and those things. But, but it is, I think, very important to note that, that Paul is saying, look, these things that I'm sharing with you, I didn't just make them up. This gospel that I preached to you, I received it. I received it the same way the other apostles received it. It's the same gospel that the other apostles are preaching but I also received it from Jesus himself. And by the way, this gospel that is somewhat summarized by Jesus' life and his death and his being buried and then his being raised to life on the third day. Jesus, after the resurrection, appeared to the apostles. But he also appeared to more than 500 people at one time. And this is what's key. He says, most of those people to whom Jesus appeared with his resurrection, resurrected body, most of those people are still living. Most of those people are still here. Implication being, you can ask them. This is not just a story where, isn't this amazing? See, you and I, we're, in some ways we operate at, a, at an advantage, but we have a disadvantage. Our advantage that, we, that I mentioned last week is we have the Scriptures. When Paul was, was writing this letter to the church in Corinth, they didn't have the New Testament Scriptures. This letter is part of what would become the New Testament Scriptures. So the good news that we have, the advantage that we have is we have the Scriptures. But the disadvantage that we have is when, when someone, when we tell other people about the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's hearsay, right? I mean, let's be fair. We are giving this account, and we are not eyewitnesses. But as Paul writes this letter to the church in Corinth, he is writing in a time and in a, in a part of the world where people who really saw the risen Jesus Christ from the dead are still living. They're still available for comment. You can still ask them. And they can tell you, I saw this with my own eyes. And that's what Paul is, Paul is saying to them. So as we, as we try to unpack this question of what exactly must we believe in order to have salvation, I really think that there are three other questions that we need to wrestle with as, as part of answering this, this ultimate question. And the three questions that we're going to walk through together this morning are these. The first is, what are our sins that Jesus Christ had to die for? In verse 3, he says that Jesus Christ died for our sins. So what are those sins? The second question that we'll look at is, what is the relationship between our sins and the death of Christ? After, After we answer the question, what are our sins, well, then what do our sins have to do with Jesus dying? Because it certainly seems that Paul is connecting the death of Jesus. That's very important as it relates to our sinfulness. 
And then the last question that we'll look at this morning together is, what does it mean to believe? This is the gospel that I have preached, but he says, this is the gospel that you have believed. What does that look like? What does it mean for us to believe? So what are our sins? What's the relationship between our sins and the death of Jesus? And what does it mean to believe? Let's start with the first question. What are our sins that Jesus had to die for? The first thing that we need to understand to understand our sins is, is what does the word sin actually mean? When we talk about sins, what are we really talking about? Well, there's a couple of different insights that we can gain. The first that I would suggest for us is that the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a, a, a broadly accepted summary of the teaching of the Scriptures, the Westminster Confession of Faith has a has a, a couple of catechisms, a shorter catechism and a longer catechism. And the, the longer catechism or the larger catechism answers the question, what is sin this way? This is sort of a, a, a summary. It's not the exhaustive answer, but it's, I think it's a pretty good summary. It says, sin is any lack of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Any lack of conformity or transgression of the law of God. God is the one who says, this is the righteous standard. This is truth. This is what is right. This is what I require. And our sinfulness is any time that we either don't conform to or that we just completely walk against the law of God. Another way of, of understanding what sin is, is is to just ask the, the question of, of what's, what's, the, what's the history of the word of sin? Because we tend to think that the word sin is a religious word. And that makes sense because in our day and age, pretty much any time you use the word sin, you're, you're kind of a point, you're, you're appealing to some kind of religious ethic or religious standard. But the reality is the word sin has not always been a religious word. The word sin, in its, in its core definition, has to do with things like archery, where you shoot an, you know, you're shooting an arrow or a, or a spear or some kind of projectile at a target. And the word sin is used to describe the reality when the projectile misses the target. So if you miss the target to the left, then it would, it would be right to say you sin to the left. Or if you miss the target to the right, then you sin to the right, or you sin high, or you sin low. You missed the mark. To sin is to miss the target. But if we're ever going to really understand what our sins are, then, then the deeper question then is, what is our target? And we've already said in some, in some sense that the target is the law of God, and that's true. But I think, it's, I think there's, there's a way that we can get our arms around this even, even more meaningfully. And that is to, to understand that God made us to honor His glory and His dominion. In other words, when God created the very first human beings... Their purpose was to honor Him, was to point to His glory and to His dominion. Listen to what, what God says about the, the very first human beings in Genesis chapter 1. God said, let us make man in our image. And I know that sounds odd for us to, to hear God refer to Himself in the plural. But this is, this is a reference to the Trinity, that God, the God of the Bible, is one God eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Is that complicated? Yes, it is. But that's the way the Scriptures reveal God to us. He is one God. We're not polytheists. There's one God, but He exists, and He has always existed in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So, God says, let us make man in our image, mankind, after our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock over the earth, and all the things that crawl along on the ground. 
So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created man, but he made us male and female. We've talked about this already. And then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all of the other creatures that I have made that fill the earth. Now, this is what God said right after he had made Adam and Eve. This was God's summary to Adam and Eve of what their purpose was. But what's interesting is if you fast forward just a little bit to Genesis chapter 9, God echoes this same kind of mandate to Noah and his family after the flood. The flood has come, God has preserved Noah and his family, and now the ark has come to rest on dry ground, and this is part of what God says to Noah and his family. He says in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, whoever sheds the blood of another person, another human, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his image. And then he turns to them and says, you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Some translations will say, and have dominion over it. So a couple of of things just to ponder here, just to think through with me here. What What does our being created in the image of God have to do with God forbidding murder? I mean, you can see here, this is, this is basically the foundation for where we get the, the God saying that murder is wrong. The taking of the life of another human being is wrong. The reason seems to be, by the way, this is long before the Ten Commandments are given, okay? So it's not like we had to wait until Exodus chapter 20 to learn that murder was wrong. Murder is wrong right here in Genesis chapter 9. But the reason that God gives for why murder is wrong is because humans have been made in the image of God. So wouldn't it make sense then to conclude that murder is wrong because it is an assault on the image of God? In other words, it's an affront to God because humans are made in His image. Another question to think about, what is the connection between multiplying and having dominion which is the mandate that God gives to the humans, what's the connection between that and our being made in the image of God? I think that as we multi- the answer is that as we multiply, we are filling the earth with God's image. That we are filling the earth, that we as human beings are pointers to God's glory and to His dominion. It's, it's sort of analogous to what, what would happen in a lot of ancient cultures where the ruler who was in charge at that particular time would fill his country or fill their nation, their dominion, with pictures or statues of themselves. Because anytime someone saw, like for example in the Roman Empire, anytime someone saw a statue of Caesar, and there were a lot of them around, that image would be a pointer to the dominion of Caesar in Rome at that time. Can you see how in many ways, when God filled the earth with his image, he filled the earth with people, us, who would be pointers to his glory and to his dominion. That's our goal. That's our target, if you will, to be pointers to to magnify the glory of God and the dominion of God. Well, if to sin is to miss the target, to miss the mark, then how have we missed the target? I would suggest to you that we have missed the target in that we have not pointed to. We have not honored God's glory and His dominion. Rather, instead, we have We have, by and large, sought our own glory. We have sought our own dominion. 
We have assumed the position of authority in our lives. Watch out for number one. Who's number one? It's me. It's us. I'm the captain now. We have placed our desires and our rights and our sense of morality above what God has said is right. And so as a result, God has justly condemned us to spiritual death. Not just spiritual death. If if you've been here for, for, for much time, you know that the Bible also teaches that physical death is a result of sin. The world is not the way God made it to be. We are not the way God made us to be. Sin has changed everything. But particularly as it relates to the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, as as we're, we're trying to wrestle with the question of, well, what are our sins? I think we have to recognize here that the result of our sin is that God is righteous and God is just and He has justly condemned us because of our sin. Genesis chapter 3 puts it this way, or or describes it this way. Therefore, the Lord God sent the man, Adam, and Eve was with him. They both were, were exiled from the Garden of Eden to work the ground which, from which the man had been taken. He drove the man out, and at the east end of the Garden of Eden, God placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. In other words, to keep Adam and Eve out. They were exiled from the Garden of Eden. They were exiled from the presence of God. They were exiled from the presence of the tree of life. And they were were never to be given access again. Not in that way. The New Testament describes it this way. In Romans chapter 3, Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's, you see, do you hear our definition of sin? For all have sinned and missed the mark, fall short of the standard. And again, in Romans chapter 6, he says, the wages of sin is death. You know what a wage is, right? A wage is what you're owed. If you work eight hours in a day, then your employer owes you eight hours of wages. That's the just thing. If you work eight hours and then your boss doesn't pay you, that's unjust. This says the wages of sin is death. If we sin, what we're owed is death. That's what we deserve. That's our sin. And that sin shows itself in every area of our lives. That sin separates us from from the favor of God, from the presence of God, the God that we were made to glorify, whose, whose glory and dominion we were supposed to be pointers. All right? Well, then what's the relationship between our sin and the death of Jesus? Well, the answer is that the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ is God's only provision for our reconciliation and our redemption. That's the only provision God has made. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that sounds kind of exclusive, doesn't it? And if you struggle with that, I understand that you do. I I think I can struggle with that too. But here's what's important. Your struggle is not with me. Your struggle isn't even with the church. Your struggle is with Jesus. Jesus is the one who said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Paul describes it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God made him who had no sin. Jesus never sinned. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him and through him 
we might possess the righteousness of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 also echoes this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we, we often ask the question, well, how, how could a loving God condemn anyone to hell? How could a loving God exile his, his creation, his creatures, out of his presence forever? I, I, that, that question occurs to me sometimes. I think that's a valid question to ask. But if that's the only question we're asking, then it assumes that the only thing we know about God is that he's loving. As if he has no other traits, as if, as if he has no other qualities. And that's not true. No one only has that quality. If, if someone said to you, you know what, what I love about you is that you are only loving. In, initially, you might be kind of, well... I'm flattered that you, that you see me that way, that, that you see me as a loving person. I mean, I want to be a loving person. I want to be viewed that way. But when they say, that's all you are, eventually you're going to start to say, well, wait, wait a minute, I, I'm, I'm actually a little more nuanced than that. Um, I mean, I, I also have a sense of justice. I also have a sense that some things are right and wrong and and I'm, I'm willing to actually correct somebody if they do the wrong thing. I'm actually willing sometimes to... In other words, we all have different qualities. We can't just boil ourselves down to one thing. And the same thing is true of God. God is loving. But what, we're, what we also need to see is that God is also just. And so as we ask the question, how could a loving God condemn people, we also have to ask the question, how can a just God allow sin to go unaddressed? And that's the beauty of the gospel. Because in the gospel, God's, God's love and his justice meet. They come together. Jesus who is God in the flesh, God incarnate, took that punishment for our sins upon himself. He died in the place of sinners so that God's justice was satisfied and that God's love could now extend mercy. That's the connection between our sins and the death of Jesus. Our sins separate us from a just God, but in his love he sent his son who had no sin to take our sin upon himself and he went to the cross so that God's justice would be satisfied and therefore the love of God can extend us mercy. The remaining question is, what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to put our trust in? in this truth, in Jesus and what he has done. It's important for us to understand that it is not enough to intellectually understand this information. It's important to intellectually understand it. But believing, trusting, having faith in this message is more than just intellectually understanding it. Each of us must personally receive and embrace Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. It's the difference between saying that Jesus is the Lord and saying that Jesus is my Lord. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, To those who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. We have a tendency to think that we're children of God because He made us. And there is, there is a sense in which we are connected to God because we are made in His image. Every human being, whether, they, whether they're Christians or Muslims or atheists, every human being has incredible value because we're all made in the image of God. 
But this, and this is sort of the, the difficult, challenging, hard saying or message of the Bible. But the Bible says that just because we are made in the image of God, that does not mean that we are in a right family relationship with God whereby we call him father and he calls us his sons and daughters. It's to those who receive him, to those who believe in his name that he gives that position, that status to be called children of God. Saving faith in Jesus Christ is not just intellectual, it's an act of the will. It's a response. This is the gospel, but it's our response to it. It's why Paul makes such a big deal about the fact that he said, this is the gospel I preached to you, but it's also the gospel that you believed. Revelations chapter 3, verse 20, the Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door of their heart, I will come in and I will make my home with you. I will take up residence in your heart. I will take up residence in your life. I will make my home with you. Most of you are familiar with the Titanic, not just the movie. I mean, it was, it was a cool movie, but it was a movie in some ways based on a historical event and an historical ship. When the Titanic was, was commissioned, I, I don't know if this was its official tagline or what it was, but, but many of the people who were responsible for the Titanic and were taking great pride in the Titanic, they started referring to it as the ship that not even God can sink. Right there, that would have been a good reason for me to never get on that boat. <laughs> I mean, that, that's just poking God in the eye. And, I, and I'm not going to stand up here and say, and God said, challenge accepted. I'm, that, that's, not, that's not it. But it's just, it's just the, you know, the, the, the whole moxie of, of what was around that particular ship. Well, after the Titanic hit the iceberg, there were, there were three kinds of people on the boat. And this is not some funny joke about, you know, three kinds of people in the world. And anyway, <clears throat> their first kind of people on the boat was there were people who knew that there was nothing to worry about. This is, we're going to be fine. It's the Titanic. The ship that not even God can sink is going to be fine. The second kind of people that were on the boat were people who were concerned that there might be something to worry about. They weren't sure. And so they inquired about evacuation measures. If, hypothetically, there were to be a problem, what would we do? And so these were people who perhaps even investigated the lifeboats. These were people who kind of figured out where the lifeboats were and started kind of hanging out a little closer to the lifeboats, just in case. But since most people were not panicking, everybody that was part of the crew of the boat didn't seem to be alarmed, they concluded that it probably wasn't anything to worry about, and so they just figured that they would not go too far from the lifeboats, but they weren't too worried. And then there were people who were pretty convinced that the ship was sinking. And so they got into lifeboats. And they started to, to sort of force the issue with lowering the lifeboats down into the water, even though the crew was telling them that they, they shouldn't be doing that. Because they knew that if the boat were to sink and they were not far away from the ship when it sank, that even if you were in a lifeboat but you were close by, you could still get sucked down by the displacement of the ship as it went down. And so they were getting into lifeboats and they were just rowing. Let's get away from this thing. 
And so you have the people who know there's nothing happening, no, no problem, nothing to worry about, nothing to see here, keep moving. There were some people who were starting to be a little bit anxious, a little concerned. Maybe we ought to learn a little bit more about what we might do if there's a problem. And then there were the people who said, I need to be in a lifeboat. Why am I telling you this? The Bible tells us pretty clearly that this world is like the Titanic. It is sinking. And it will be judged ultimately by God's justice. And so the question that I think every human should be wrestling with is which of these three kinds of people are you? Are you ignoring the lifeboat because you're convinced that nothing is going to happen? That this idea of, of God's justice and his, and his judgment is just a myth, it's just a legend, it's just a story, but it's not real? There's nothing to worry about because these things aren't true? Are you the person who knows all about the lifeboat? Maybe you've been in church a lot. Maybe you've even read some of the Bible yourself, and you know about the lifeboat, but you still haven't done anything about it. You're not in the lifeboat. You just kind of hang around other people who know stuff about the lifeboat, and maybe you even know some people who are in the lifeboat. But you yourself have not gotten in. Or are you in the lifeboat and rowing towards safety and away from the pull of the sinking ship. As I, as I think about these questions about the different kinds of scenarios that, that we could find ourselves in in terms of our faith, our belief, I have to answer that question for myself. And here's, I'll share with you kind of what my answer is for, for myself in this regard. I think I'm the third person. And you're probably thinking, well, I hope so. We hired you to be our pastor, <laughs> right? <clears throat> but I, I, I think I'm the third person. I'm in the lifeboat. But here's also my honest assessment. If you didn't know what I do for a living, in other words, if you didn't see me here and you didn't hear me talk here, and you only saw me away from the church and away from relationships with, with Christians like, like most of you. I wonder if you'd know that I was in a lifeboat. I'm not, I'm not trying to get fired. I'm not trying to get you to think differently about me. I'm just, I'm just letting you know. I'm just trying to, I, I, I need to assess myself honestly the way that I hope you too will assess yourself. It's not that I'm a bad person. It's, it's not that, that my life, you know, that, that I'm one way with you and I'm, and I'm something else with other people. I don't think that's true. But what I really wonder is if someone who didn't know I was a pastor and didn't know that I was connected to SPEP Church and they just knew me out there, would they look at me and say, there's a big difference between this guy and everybody else in the world. Because if I'm, if I'm honest, I probably spend a good bit of my time and my energy pursuing things that everyone else in the world is pursuing. And I'm not even saying that those are all bad things, but is it clear is it, is it clear from just looking at my life to someone that doesn't know me in this context that I am in the lifeboat and I'm rowing to safety, away from the pull of the sinking ship? The question that I would just would leave with you is, where are you? Which of these three kinds of people describes your life? If you're not in the lifeboat... Do you recognize that you're sinking? Do you recognize that, that you can't save yourself? To believe 
is to ask Jesus Christ, who is the lifeboat. If you, if you haven't gotten the analogy yet, he is the lifeboat. No one comes to the Father except through me, he says. So, have you asked Jesus Christ for permission to come aboard? To pray and say, Lord, I need to be in you. I need to be in the boat because I recognize that without you I'm sinking. Sincere requests to come on board are never denied. Do you understand that? Sincere requests to come aboard with Jesus Christ are never denied. Because when you stop, well, I think I'll just leave you there, okay? I, I, I think when, G, when, when Paul says, this is the gospel I preach, this is the gospel you've believed, the question is, do you believe it? Not just intellectually, but volitionally. To come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need to come aboard. Let me gently say this as well to those of you who are lifeboat experts. Because it's possible to be a lifeboat expert to actually, but not actually be in the lifeboat. Hanging around the lifeboat is not the same as being in the lifeboat. Hanging around other people who are in the lifeboat is not the same as being in the lifeboat. Knowing how the lifeboat works is not the same as being in. Being in requires that you come to Jesus, that you say, Lord, I know I'm sinking and I know I can't save myself. I need you. I need you to be my deliverance. I need you to be my rescue. Let me close this in prayer. Father, this, this gospel is really not that complicated. But it is very difficult to embrace fully. Because to embrace it fully means that we need to confess that we cannot rescue ourselves. We need to confess that when we boil it all down, I do not measure up to the righteous standard that I have fallen short of the mark. I have missed the target. I'm a sinner. And that before you, the just and righteous judge, you cannot just let my sin go unaddressed. But Lord, we thank you that even as you are the just God, you also love us really more than we know, more than we can comprehend. And in your love, you have satisfied your own justice by sending your own son to do it for us. And you've given us this promise, this offer, that if anyone would come to you through faith in your son, through trust in your son, receiving your son as, that, as the one who has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves, then your promise is that we are your children, that our sins are forgiven, and you give us newness of life and an eternal hope with you forever. Lord, help us to examine our own hearts, every one of us. Where are we in response? Are we just living because we don't believe there's anything to worry about? Or are we a little bit conscious of this reality and we want to be a little close to the lifeboat, but we're not really in it? Lord, if we're in either of those places, Lord, don't let us rest there. Bring us to the place where we climb into the boat because you've invited us to come. And those of us, Lord, who are in the boat, help us to have a zeal and a love and a heart for helping other people find their rescue as well. Thank you for your love for us in Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.